Okay, today we're moving on to the second main section in class, and that's on jumping biomechanics. Um, like the previous section on running, jumping is motivated as a topic in this class because jumping is a sport in and of itself, like high jump, long jump, in terms of jumping performance. Um, and it's also a key element of many other sports. So just like running, um, you don't necessarily have to be a good jumper to be good at all sports or any sport. Um, you can certainly come up with particular sports where running's not that important and jumping's not that important, or even sports where that's not something you need to be able to do at all to be good at that sport or to participate in the sport. But for many sports, that's not the case. For many sports, you're, it's gonna help you to be a good runner and a good jumper. There's a lot of sports where uh, being able to jump high, being able to jump far, or jump fast, or to time your jumps well is a, a, a key element for performance in that sport. And here I'm thinking of things like uh, basketball, volleyball, uh, gymnastics, football, soccer, all sports where being able to jump well is going to be beneficial to performance in that sport. Um, the paper today is by Bobert and Van Soest, and a review article in 2001 titled Why Do People Jump the Way That They Do? Um, what they were doing in this paper is they observe in, in uh, many of their experiments, and th these, uh, these two authors are some of the leading researchers in the world on, on the mechanics of vertical jumping, uh, they've observed in, in their experiments and in others this, what they refer to as a stereotypical kinematic pattern down here. Um, what that stereotypical pattern is referring to is there's a wide range of jumping abilities between different people, as we all know. Some people are real good jumpers, some people not so good jumpers. But regardless of jumping ability, um, when you give an individual the task of jumping as high as possible, more or less everyone uses a fairly similar pattern of motion to accomplish that task, right? Some people might accomplish it better than others. Some are good jumpers, some are bad jumpers. Um, but the pattern of motion, the movement of the joints, the movement of the segments of the body, the activation pattern and sequence of the muscles associated with those movements is pretty stereotypical, is pretty similar between people, regardless of if they're a good jumper or a bad jumper. Um, and so what they were trying to answer here was why that particular uh, kinematic pattern is, is good, why it's the one that maximizes jump height in uh, humans. And so this is uh, one of my favorite things that I like to see in, in the sport biomechanics world. Rather than just observing the way things are, uh, trying to explain the way things are and trying to explain why this is a good way of jumping, not just that it is a good way of jumping. Um, that, that why part is really the key to uh, using things like this in, in, in a practical setting in terms of improving performance. Okay. So the text of this paper doesn't actually have a whole lot uh, directly to do with sports, but there's certainly lessons we could take from here that would apply to sports. Like if an individual is uh, not jumping as high as they want and they don't have time to do like weeks or months on some sort of strength or power training program and they say, well, what can I do to jump higher? Well, you might start off with using, uh, examining their technique and seeing if there's any flaw, obvious flaws in there that could be quickly corrected and lead to a more immediate improvement in jump height. So an example of something you could take away um, about sports from this paper, even though there's not a whole lot directly about uh, sports here. Um, if you're reading this paper and you don't know what's going on, if it's, you're like, I, what the heck is happening here? Um, don't, don't feel bad. This is a difficult paper. Uh, this is not an undergraduate level paper. This is like graduate and, and, and professor level stuff in here. This is, this, these are some complex uh, topics in biomechanics. Um, I picked this one just to give you guys an example of kind of the high level of, of research and high level of thinking uh, that goes on in something that seems like a simple movement like jumping and something that seems uh, like a simple question on why do people jump uh, the way that they do. So there's complex stuff here. Don't, don't worry if you don't get all of it necessarily on, on the first read or, or ever. Um, what I'll try and do here um, through my videos that I'll show is give kind of my dumbed down uh, take on this that'll hopefully be uh, digestible to most of you. So, so I'll try and dumb this down to an undergraduate level even though it's not really a, a undergraduate level material. The specifics here is something that we would tend to cover in like a graduate uh, level class. Okay, um, what are they examining here? Um, they looked at performing a maximum height jump using a technique called a squat jump. And what is that? Um, when people jump, there's generally two types of jumps that they do. They do either a squat jump or a counter movement jump. Um, a counter movement jump is what everyone's probably gonna do. If I tell you just get up from your chair and pause the video and jump as high as you can, you're probably gonna do a counter movement jump. You will start standing straight up and down you will then uh, squat down to the ground, but you'll do that squat dynamically. You'll bottom out instantaneously and then immediately start pressing against the ground to jump up into the air. That's the counter movement jump. Um, the squat jump is where you squat down, 
but then you hold that squat for a while. Like you hold it for like a small number of seconds. You pause in that squatted posture. Then from that initial squatted posture, then you start pressing against the ground. Kind of like you're doing a leg press uh, against the ground, starting from like the middle of the leg press, starting from uh, with, with flexion of the hip and, and the knee and the ankle. So counter movement jump, um, a dynamic squat. Uh, squat jump, a static squat. Squatting down, holding it, and starting the jump from that initial squatted posture. Um, why do we study squat jumps? Why do we do squat jumps if they don't jump as high as, as the counter movement jump? Um, the counter movement jump is always going to jump higher, um, regardless of, uh, I shouldn't say regardless, you could probably have really bad jumping mechanics and maybe your squat jumps better. But for most people who don't have awful jumping mechanics or some sort of injury or illness of some sort, um, you're going to jump higher with the counter movement jump. Um, the goal of jumping, however, in sports is not necessarily always to jump as high as possible. Um, sometimes the timing of the jump or sometimes the uh, other elements of the jump are, are more important. So squat jump is just a, a kind of another tool in the arsenal of, of, of the effective versatile athlete. Uh, squat jumps get studied scientifically because it's the simpler motion. It lacks that counter movement, which can be an element of complexity. And uh, squat jumps are also still relevant to a lot of sporting applications. Like, for example, if you're uh, jumping for a rebound in basketball and you're boxing somebody out to, to get the rebound, then you're probably doing something more akin to a squat jump than a counter movement jump. So it does have practical applications uh, in real sports along with being a simpler motion. Um, what they observe here in, in, in reference to this stereotyped kinematic pattern is this uh, proximo-distal sequence that they refer to throughout the paper. And rather than trying to describe in words what that is, I'm just going to show you a video of what that is, or a demonstration here. So let's pull up my video there. And get a nice wide shot here so you can hopefully see all of me. Okay. And I am not a good jumper. I'm an endurance athlete and not a particularly good one, so don't expect much here. Um, but the squat jump will be when you start in a static squatted posture here, and then you hold it for a little while, just nice and static and steady there. And then from this initial squat, press your legs into the ground like you do in a leg press and try and jump as high as you can. So something like this. Okay. And now if I were to do that movement in slow motion, what you would see would be a proximal to distal sequence of the motion of my body segments caused by a proximal to distal sequence of the activation of my main extensor muscle groups, the glutes and the quadriceps and the plantar flexors. Okay. Um, proximal to distal, what's that mean? If you're not familiar with those terms, if you haven't taken anatomy recently or at all, um, proximal means closer up to the center of the body and distal means further away from the center of the body. So in reference to my legs, my hip is my most proximal joint and my ankle is my most distal joint. Okay? Um, my hip is proximal to my knees, my knees are distal to my hip, and my ankle is distal to my knees. Okay? So further away from the center, more distal, closer up to the center, more proximal. Okay? Um, if I were to do that squat jump in slow motion, what you would see would be first initiating the motion by moving my most proximal segment, my trunk. Okay? Then once my trunk gets more or less upright, then you start seeing appreciable motion of the thighs and appreciable motion of the shank. And then only at the very end, when I'm straight up and down and ready to finally take off the ground, do you see motion of the ankles and the feet, that last final plantar flexion motion to really push off the ground and finish the jump. Okay? <coughs> Um, that proximal to distal sequence, um, you can also think of it in terms of activation of the muscle groups involved, the main extensor muscle groups, the glutes, the quads, and the uh, plantar flexors, the motions involved in kind of pressing against the floor, if you think of this as kind of a leg press motion. Um, first, from the squat, you would first see me activating my glutes to get my trunk going up, and then you would see me activating my quads to start the press. And then at the end, you would see me activating my uh, calf muscles to do that plantar flexion, the final push off the ground. Now, why is that proximal to distal sequence a good thing for jumping as high as possible? Um, it's easiest to demonstrate if I show you what happens when you don't do it. Um, in the paper, they talk about some things uh, like minimizing angular velocities of, of the proximal joints and things like that. 
um, it's easier for me to think about uh, what happens if I don't move the body in that way. So for example, what happens if I start in my squat here, and rather than doing my trunk first, what happens if I do my ankles and my feet first? Okay. Well, so I'm just going to start here in my squat, and I'm going to plantar flex my ankles, and watch what my hips do compared to what my trunk does. Okay. My hips move up in the air, right? but my trunk either stays put or even goes down a little bit, right? moving kind of in the opposite direction I want to get it to go. Whereas if I do that same motion, that same plantar flexion, after I've already done the trunk and the thigh and the, and the hip and the knee and gotten straight up and down here, then my plantar flexion gets my trunk moving straight up into the air. So mechanically, why is that happening? Well, when I'm straight up and down like this, I plantar flex my toes into the ground. That generates a ground reaction force pointing upward that when I'm straight up and down, runs more or less straight through my center of mass. So directly applying the ground reaction force vertically through the center of mass to get me up into the air. Okay. Whereas if I'm hunched over like this, my trunk is big and heavy, and right now my center of mass is out in front here. And when I flex my toes like this, when I'm squatted, then my ground reaction force is a little bit behind my center of mass. And since it's behind it, it's going to create a torque in this direction that's going to tend to topple me over and press my head into the countertop here and uh, do the opposite thing that I want, actually moving my trunk or tending to move my trunk down into the ground. Okay. So the posture of the body here, or getting into this posture where that final plantar flexion can actually contribute to moving the center of mass up in the air is one big reason why we move the uh, body segments in that particular sequence there. I'm sorry, it looks like my, my video paused there for a second. Okay. Okay, so you might wonder then, well, why, why squat at all then? Like, why do I start down here if I just want to get here and can direct the, uh, the ground reaction force straight through the center of mass? Um, again, it's easier to demonstrate if I show what happens if you don't do it. Um, if I start the jump here, straight up and down, then yeah, I can use my ankle muscles to move everything more or less directly straight up and down, but I can't do anything here with my hip and with my knee, right? Um, my hip motion, when I'm in this position, my hip, anything that I do with my hip is gonna move my center of mass down, right? Like if I start flexing and extending my hip here, it's not really moving my center of mass up in the air, right? I'm just kind of waving it back and forth. Similarly, if I start moving my knee, if I start with my knee fully extended, my knee has nothing to contribute here to moving my center of mass upwards and into the air, right? Any motion that I do with my knee here is moving my center of mass down into the ground, which I don't want. So by starting in this squatted posture, one reason why that's good is now I have the opportunity for my hip muscles to contribute to that motion of moving the center of mass up and for my knee muscles to contribute, okay? Rather than just starting here and trying to do the whole thing with my plantar flexors, which obviously I can't jump very high when I do that. Um, another reason that the squat is helpful is related to a property of muscles that's pretty important that we haven't talked about yet, and that's the force length relationship of muscles. Um, when I squat down like this, I'm stretching all three of my big, strong, extensor muscle groups. When I squat down like this, I'm flexing my hip, and that stretches my plantar flexors, I'm flexing my knee, and that stretches my quadriceps, and I'm dorsiflexing my ankle, and that stretches my plantar flexors. Okay. So, squatting down to flex the hip and stretch the glutei, flex the knee to stretch the quadriceps, and dorsiflex the ankle to stretch the plantar flexors. Okay. Now, why is that a good thing? Let's take a look at a diagram here of the force length relationship. Um, this graph here is showing on the x-axis uh, what they call the normalized length of the muscle. So the length of the muscle um, relative to one here, which is the muscle's like hypothetical optimal length. Um, on the y-axis is showing the uh, force that the muscle can produce. Um, again, normalized to like its maximum possible force. So zero here, excuse me, zero would be no force, one would be max force, um, one here on the x-axis would be the 
length of the muscle at which it produces its maximum force. And then uh, to the left would be shorter lengths and to the right would be longer lengths. Okay. So um, based on the posture of your joints, whether it's flexed or extended to a certain angle, that's going to affect the length of the muscle and is going to affect how much force it can produce. Um, the kind of smaller scale underpinnings of this relationship relate to the overlap between the actin and myosin proteins in, in muscle at the microscopic level, kind of down to the, uh, down to the, the, the myofilament and the cellular level, um, where at certain lengths, there's more or less overlap between the actin and the myosin proteins and more opportunity for the muscle to produce the most force. And that, that overlap is maximized at some uh, particular moderate length here, typically. Um, so it looks like from this diagram that you can stretch the muscle to a certain length and increase how much force it can produce. But if you stretch it too far, you start decreasing how much force it can produce. And here I'm not really talking about like uh, stretching, like the exercise of stretching. I'm just talking about the, uh, the length of the muscle during our normal ranges of motion. Sometimes it's going to be uh, longer than in other poses. Sometimes it's going to be shorter than in other poses. Um, so it does, it is indeed possible to like stretch the muscle too far and impair how much force it can produce. But in general, for, for most like normal ranges of motion of most major muscle groups, we don't really operate on this uh, descending limb of the force length curve very much. It's really hard to get the muscle into positions where it's stretched so far that it appreciably gets deep into this uh, descending limb of the force length curve, where you're stretching it so far that it's impairing how much force it can produce. Um, most of the time during normal ranges of motion, including most of the motions that you see in something like jumping, you're going to be operating on the uh, lengths of the muscles associated with this ascending limb of the force length curve, meaning the longer you stretch the muscle, the, the, the greater the length that you stretch it to, the more force it's going to be able to produce. Okay? So by doing that squatted posture, by squatting down and uh, flexing my hip, which stretches my glutei up the force length curve here, um, flexing my knee, which stretches my quadriceps up this curve, and uh, dorsiflexing my ankle, which stretches my plantar flexors up this curve. I'm taking all three of those main strong extensor muscle groups that are really important for jumping and kind of priming them for being ready to produce a lot of force. Right? So giving them an opportunity to produce a lot of force and perform a lot of work on the center of mass in the vertical direction. So two benefits there for, for doing the squat. I give the, uh, the hip and the knee muscles an opportunity to be involved, and I give all of the muscles an opportunity to produce a lot of force by stretching them up to, to stronger places here on their force length curve. We really don't operate on this descending limb too much. We spend most of our time in normal ranges of motion on this ascending limb. Okay, a few more details on the mechanics here uh, that I wanted to go over related to that notion of giving the hip and the, uh, the knee an opportunity to contribute to the motion here. Um, just some general classical theories on, uh, on, on physics in terms of how we move the body or how we move a body in general. Um, suppose your body starts on the ground and you want to move it into the air. Well, how do I do that exactly? Um, you can take a force-centered approach, which is primarily the impulse-momentum relationship. Or you can take an energy-centered approach, which is based on conservation of energy and the uh, work-energy principle here. Uh, Force-centered approach, this is one that I talk about in uh, Kines 300, if you took Kines 300 with me. At least I think I talk about this in Kines 300. Um, it, this is the impulse-momentum relationship. And this says if you apply a certain force to a mass, such as your body, for a certain amount of time, um, that force applied for that amount of time, if you multiply them together, um, that gives you the impulse of that force, the force that the average force times the duration of time that you apply it for. That's the impulse of that force. And that impulse will equal the change in momentum of the mass that the force is being applied to. In the case of your body, this would be your body mass. Okay? Um, in the case of doing a squat jump, your change in velocity here would be the velocity that you start at in the vertical direction, which would be zero at the start of the squat, um, compared to the velocity when you stop producing that force or when your feet come off the ground and your ground reaction force is now zero. Okay? So you can think of jumping here from kind of a force-based approach as maximizing the amount of impulse that you apply with your feet on the ground in order to maximize the change in velocity 
while your feet are on the ground there. So increasing it from zero up to the highest possible vertical velocity before you take off. Okay? So from the force centered approach here, jumping is really about maximizing takeoff velocity. The faster you're moving in the vertical direction when your feet first leave the ground, the higher you're gonna jump. Um, everything that you do mechanically to jump in terms of maximizing height is dictated by what happens when your feet are on the ground. As soon as your feet leave the ground, you've uh, seeded all your ability to affect how high you're gonna jump. You're gonna get to some height, and what you do while you're airborne really can't affect how high you're gonna get anymore. That's already been dictated by what happened when you're on the ground, and specifically by what your takeoff velocity was when you left the ground. Okay. Um, this is a useful approach if we consider the body like a point mass, like if I'm just focusing on the center of mass. Um, things get a little more complicated though if I'm dealing with like a multi-articular body here, like they show in figure one, where, yeah, my goal here is to maximize the height of uh, C, which is the center of mass there. And to do that, I wanna maximize the takeoff velocity, the vertical velocity when I leave the ground. But how do I do that exactly? Right? That's, that's easier said than done. How exactly should I uh, use the hip and use the knee and use the ankle to, to achieve that goal, to produce a really big impulse and a really big takeoff velocity? Um, that question is a little bit easier to address using another uh, approach from classical physics on theories of movement, and that's an energy-centered approach, which is based on conservation of energy and the work energy principle. And again, if you took Kines 300 uh, with me, I don't know how much time uh, uh, Dr. Asani or Dr. Shim spend on these topics, but I spend quite a bit of time uh, going over these approaches, and I think we might even talk about them in, in, uh, for jumping a little bit. Um, conservation of energy says that there's three main types of mechanical energy that a body in motion can have. There's uh, KE, kinetic energy, PE, potential energy, and uh, SE, strain energy, or elastic strain energy, like we talked about with uh, the rubber band and with the, the, the Nike shoes and all that business. Um, strain energy is a pretty small amount of energy here in this particular case for jumping. So just for simplicity, we're gonna chop that off here. So we've got kinetic energy, if I can get on the left here, uh, kinetic energy, Ke, which is one half times mass times velocity squared, and I've got potential energy, Pe, which is mass times gravity times height. Okay. So the faster I'm moving, or the higher my velocity is, the more kinetic energy I'm going to have, and the higher I am above the ground, or the greater H is, the more potential energy I'm gonna have. Um, the way that you can think of potential energy is that this is um, energy that could potentially become kinetic energy due to gravity, right? Like if you drop a ball from a, a, a large height above the ground, um, the higher that you drop it from, the faster it's gonna be moving before it eventually hits the ground, right? Um, that's because the higher that you drop it from, the greater H is, the more potential energy it has, and the more potential energy there is to get transformed by gravity into kinetic energy. Okay? So that's what I like to think of as potential energy, as energy that could potentially become kinetic energy due to the effect of gravity and due to uh, how long gravity will be acting on an airborne object there. So for example, when I leave the ground here, when I jump and I leave the ground and I have a certain vertical velocity, um, because of that velocity, I'm going to have a certain amount of kinetic energy. Okay? Um, eventually, I'm going to be going up and up and up into the air after I leave the ground. And while I'm doing that, though, gravity is acting on me the whole time and is constantly slowing down this vertical velocity. Okay? Eventually, it slows it down so much that my velocity is zero, and then it starts increasing it in the negative direction, and I fall back to the ground. Um, what's happening there energetically is I leave the ground with all this kinetic energy and then while I'm moving upward into the air, I'm slowing down in the vertical direction and so my kinetic energy is decreasing. My velocity is decreasing. Um, energetically though, so this to, to obey conservation of energy so that my total mechanical energy, my sum of all these mechanical energy stays the same, where does that kinetic energy go? Well, it gets transformed into potential energy because I keep rising up higher and higher into the air. Okay? Um, eventually, my velocity is zero, and all my kinetic energy has been transformed into potential energy, 
And at that point, I'm at the highest height that I'm going to get to before I start uh, falling back down to the ground. Okay. So if I want to maximize the height that I reach, the way to do that energetically is to leave the ground at the highest possible height, like your center of mass as high above the ground as possible. And so that's why it's good to be fully extended, like to have your, your, your hip you know, fully uh, extended and your knee fully extended and your ankle fully, fully uh, plantar flexed when you leave the ground. That's maximizing your initial height above the ground or maximizing your initial potential energy. And then it's also why you want to leave the ground with the highest possible vertical velocity. That gives you the most kinetic energy to potentially uh, transform into uh, additional potential energy to reach an even greater height. Okay? Um, and so this is why people that are tall tend to be able to jump high because they're starting high above the ground already. Their center of mass is already high above the ground. And also why people that can uh, generate a lot of takeoff velocity are typically the best jumpers. That gives them the most possible kinetic energy to transform into additional potential energy while they're in the air. Okay? Um, where does the muscular piece come in here? Well, the only way to increase your total mechanical energy is to perform work on the mass. Okay? And this is what's happening when I'm in that initial squatted posture. I'm giving myself additional kinetic energy and additional potential energy. I'm increasing both of these at the same time rather than increasing one and decreasing the other. And how do I do that? That seems like it's violating conservation of energy. Well, it would be if there was no work being done on me, but I am doing work on myself when I'm uh, performing this squatting motion, when I'm starting in the squat and pressing my feet into the ground and moving upward uh, before I leave the ground, I'm increasing my total mechanical energy by performing work with my muscles here, performing work on my, my center of mass. I'm increasing my kinetic energy as much as I can by maximizing V, and I'm increasing my potential energy by maximizing H, by extending myself and getting my center of mass as high as I can before takeoff with the fastest possible velocity. Okay. So all reasons based on basic physics on why this uh, stereotypical pattern of motion is beneficial for maximizing jump height and, and why most people, especially people that are into sports and are, are fairly well-practiced athletes, kind of intuitively do something at least approaching this proximal to distal sequence. It's just kind of the natural thing that we, we seem to do as, as a human species to uh, jump as high as possible. Okay, that is it for today and we will see you next time for more jumping mechanics.